Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Special study this morning called 40 Days and 40 Nights. And it's very interesting. This is almost like a sequel to our study we did last week called uh, Two or Three Witnesses. And I really didn't even plan it that way, but as I felt led to do the 40 days and 40 nights study, then as I kept studying for it, it's like, wow, there's a lot of stuff in this that really connects to that study from last week. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit, of course. Very interesting. Um, the number 40 is one of those numbers in the Bible where you can completely nail down what it means. And the numbers are used many times in God's Word, but sometimes it's kind of hard to to know exactly what a number stands for, if you want to put it that way. But the number 40, it has to do with um, testing, trials, and temptation. And of course, a number, it's not like that's just like, oh, this is randomly what it means. The Bible, the different scriptures where numbers are used will show you what those numbers mean. Like the number 18 many times is connected with bondage, like when they were in uh, captivities in the book of Judges and so forth. But 40 many times has to do with the temptation, the trials. So it, it's a very interesting study. There's so much prophecy in this that will prepare you to make that final stand. And we're going to begin our study in Genesis chapter 6. The, the waters, the, the flood of Noah... Waters came down for 40 days and 40 nights, but we're going to see that the waters did prevail on the earth for even longer than that. There's so much prophecy in it, so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word in this place you've given us. We can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. So, all right, we pick it up in Genesis chapter 6. Noah, he's even called Noah the preacher in another scripture in, uh, in the book of Peter. I can't remember where it exactly it's at, unfortunately. But you see, um, there's two people that says they walked with God, and that's Noah and Enoch. So let's go Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, and it reads, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, Verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, every time you read about sons of God in the Old Testament, it's talking about angels. You also have it in Job chapter 1, verse 6, Job chapter 2, verse 1, and Job chapter 38, verse 7, which that one's even talking about in the first earth age. So these sons of God are angels. These are the fallen angels. You read in Jude chapter 1 verse 6 how they left their habitation. They were not born of woman. They came down to earth and as we're about to read, they seduce woman. And, um, so, and you see in Jude chapter 1 verse 6, they are damned for that. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. For that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. God does not just try to, every second, try to bring his wrath down, you know. I mean, he knows we're in flesh. He knows we make mistakes. Of course, there's never an excuse to sin. We should always try our very best to never sin. But we're going to fall short at times. But you see, what was happening here is just absolute perversion, pure evil. And so God set the point at this time, there's going to be 120 more years, and then I'm bringing down this flood. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. These giants, they are the offspring of the fallen angels. That word giants is Nephilim. That Hebrew word is used one other place in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. How it says they are of the sons of Anak, which is a giant so these, these giants are the offspring of the fallen angels. And also after that, when the sons of God, that's the angels, came in unto the daughters of men, 
and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. I mean, great, mighty, giant warriors. And you notice how it says, also after that. You see, God brought the flood of Noah, and it wiped out all the giants. But then the fallen angels came back another time after the flood. That's why it says, also after that. And that would be like Goliath. Of course, that was way after the flood. But he was a descendant of the second influx of the fallen angels. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Of course, God knows all things, but He still, when this evil, things like that happen, it still makes Him incredibly sad. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. I mean, it made Him so sad that what was going on after he put our souls in these flesh bodies. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And this, how it says he was uh, perfect in his generations, that means his seed line was perfect, meaning that they did not mix with the fallen angels. His family remained true. They did not partake in that pure evil. And do you remember what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10? It says that a woman ought to have power over her head because of the angels. And the, that's the fallen angels. And, of course, you know you have that power over Satan and over evil spirits and over fallen angels through the name of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. And so now we're going to skip down a little bit for the sake of time. Um, so, but you will see in these next few verses that the, God's given the instruction. Noah's going to build the ark. There's very many interesting things in that. But so we're going to go all the way down to Genesis chapter 7, picking it up in verse 1, and it reads, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Verse 2, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So the clean ones, they would be for food and also for sacrifice. Verse 3. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Verse 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And all the wickedness, unnatural things that were going on, that's what God decided had to happen. Now again, for the sake of time, let's skip down to verse 16. I don't want anyone falling out of any three-story windows. So we're going to go chapter 7, verse 16 of the book of Genesis. And they that went in, uh, and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. They were protected in that ark. Of course, the flood all around. But them in that ark were completely protected. They were sealed. Now skip down with me to verse 24 of Genesis chapter 7. And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. You know how long that is? That's five months. Make note of Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. It speaks of when Satan will be here as the false Christ. It speaks of how a flood is going to come out of his mouth. But it's not a flood of water. It's a flood of lies. A flood of deception. 
And you would see in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, it would say, um, the, the coming of the Son of Man is going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. It says, because before the flood, they were eating and drinking, giving and taking in marriage. Then the, that's what even what the fallen angels were doing. But then the flood came. And then so connecting to this five months, make note of Revelation chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, where you have the locust army. And those locust army are evil angels. We just mentioned Revelation chapter 12 and verses 7 through 9. You find out that when Satan's cast out on earth as the false Christ, the fallen angels are coming with him. And so and you read about the locust army of the wicked angels in Revelation chapter 9. It says how they, they don't devour the, the green thing or the, the grass or the herb. Why? Because they're, of course they're not actual locusts. But it says that what, what they will do is they will hurt men five months. And it means that they will hurt their souls. They are trying to bring deception because then it says in verse 5 that they can't even kill those that don't have the seal in their forehead. Meaning even those that don't have the truth in their mind, they can't kill them. But they have power to torment five months. This prophecy that we have all the way of five months back in Genesis chapter 7 verse 24. But you see, when you have the truth, the seal of God in your forehead, meaning the truth sealed in your mind, you are sealed and protected, just like Noah and his, his family were sealed in that ark. So the time is coming. Study to show yourself approved. Now let's uh, go one step further on this, and uh, we're going to kind of shift gears a little, but at the same time, it's a lot connected. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 9. We mentioned that in Numbers chapter 13, uh, where it mentions a Anak, the sons of Anak, the Anakims. Uh, they are the giants, the offspring of the fallen angels. We're going to, and also remember, sometimes there's even a sect of the offspring that are even called Raphium, like we just uh, mentioned, read about in Isaiah chapter 26 just a few days ago. But so we're going to pick it up in Deuteronomy chapter 9. What's going on here? We're, they're getting very close to the time that they're going to enter into the promised land, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, do you know how long that they wandered in the wilderness? 40 years. And guess what? You, re you read in Numbers chapter 13, or it might be Numbers chapter 14. But you know why that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? It was one year for each day that they went and spied out the land. They did that for 40 days, and then they brought back an evil report. They said, oh, we can't do it. We can't get the victory. We can't go take it. They even went so far rebelled. They tried to appoint a captain to take them back into slavery, into Egypt. Crazy. When God told them, I'm giving you the victory. It doesn't matter what you see there. I've prepared it. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's all there for you. Just go take it. But they didn't trust God. But So that's about where we're at here. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 1. And it reads, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself. Cities great and fenced up to heaven. Verse 2, A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest and of whom thou hast heard say, Who can stand before the children of Anak? They might have been freaking out about it, but it's not a problem at all if God's on your side. In that number, chapter 13, verse 33, they even say we were as grasshoppers in their sight. I mean, we're talking about actual giants here, like anywhere up to about 13 feet tall. Verse 3. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly. As the Lord hath said unto thee. He said that's what was going to happen. Why would they doubt? I mean, and think about it. They saw God part the Red Sea. He saw, they saw God bring manna down from heaven. Bring quail. And they would doubt that God could give them the victory. Don't you ever doubt God. 
verse 4. And remember Hebrews chapter, is it Hebrews chapter 11? Or no, Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. But Jesus Christ, after, his elect, or after he resurrected, would say to Thomas who doubted, Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. You don't have to see. God makes himself known so clear. I mean, you don't ever have to doubt that God is real when you serve him because he transforms lives. You see that happen. You see pure happiness and peace of mind. And you see him just completely, someone who may have been on the way of just their whole life destroyed, basically. And then when they start studying God's word, when they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they truly try to serve God, and their whole life completely changes. God makes Himself known so well. You, it's like you might as well see Him. You might as well hear His voice. That's how easy and how clear it is to know that God is real and how much He blesses those who serve Him. Verse 4, Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying... For my righteousness, the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. They're saying, you better not go say that. Because, first of all, our righteousness is as filthy rags anyway. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. I mean, th but especially they constantly were murmuring, complaining against God. So God's saying, you better not say, oh, we're so righteousness. is why we got this land. No, that's not the reason. Well, what is the reason? Continuing verse 4. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. The Canaanite nations did all types of evil, including mixing with the fallen angels, the second influx. Verse 5. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's several scriptures you can read. That one is Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. Verse 6. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Don't ever be stiff-necked. Don't harden your heart. Verse 7. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until you came unto this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Verse 8. Also in Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, ye provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. And don't worry, we're going to read more detail about that. Verse 9, When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, and this is, of course, Moses speaking, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. Verse 10, And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. This is the Ten Commandments. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord God spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Verse 11, And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence. For thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. When God parted the Red Sea and did so many miracles, then they want to worship some golden calf. Let's go read about it. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 32. And there, it, it kind of gave us a shorter summary if we would have kept going there in Deuteronomy chapter 9. But let's go straight to it. And you would see in Exodus chapter 24, I believe it's the last verse, as we just had mentioned in Deuteronomy 9, Moses was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. The testing period to the people. I mean, 40 days and 40 nights is not all that long. That's all, that's all it took for them to go start worshiping some golden calf. How crazy is that? 
There's a lot of prophecy in it. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 32, picking up in verse 1. And it reads, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. And remember, Aaron would be the high priest. And said unto him, uh, Make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, they're notice they're not even giving God credit. We want not, we don't know what has become of him. It's only been 40 days. That's it. They're going to start worshiping a false god? After all God has already done for them? It's unthinkable. Verse 2. And Aaron, it's unbelievable that he does, that Aaron even does this. I mean, he, he should have, if anyone should have been the one to set things right and put a stop to this, it should have been Aaron, who would be the high priest. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Remember, they got many of that, those golden things when they did come out of Egypt. Verse 3. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And you know, a lot of pre preachers, they just love to pass the plate. Verse 4. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I mean, can you believe that they were saying that? Verse 5. But you see, they're... Uh, or, no, okay, verse 5, I wanted to mention something after this. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. That's to Yahweh. So they are saying that this is a feast to the true God, but they're worshiping these golden calves. Or a golden calf. I mean, so you see, some people, you have to do things God's way. Sometimes intentions might be good. But if you're doing something that's completely idolatry, of course, it's not good. It's evil that takes you all the way to the deception of the false Messiah. Satan's going to be on earth. He's going to be disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. Billions of Christians are going to say, we're worshiping the Lord. We're worshiping Jesus Christ. We're worshiping Yahweh, the true God. But it is the false God. Don't be deceived. It's going to be the most incredible revival anyone's ever seen, the most religious thing anyone's ever seen, Satan being here as the false god, bringing peace to the world, spreading riches to the world, saying the Christ has returned. Are you ready for that? Verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, so religious. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You understand that's what the tribulation is like. They think it's heaven on earth. A lot of people are falsely taught, oh yeah, billions of people are just going to be getting slaughtered. That's not what the tribulation is about at all. It's about false religion. It's about apostasy. Satan will be disguised as Christ claiming to be Christ. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. And you, this uh, is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7. Then you know what it says just a couple verses after that in verse 11? These things happen as an example for a warning upon whom the ends of the world shall come. Verse 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way. It only took 40 days and 40 nights, which I have commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Verse 10, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make thee of a great nation. I mean, God was ready to just wipe them all out, but Moses interceded. He, and we're going to skip down to verse 19 here, but you can read it in between. And don't forget Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1. You see how incredible intercessors 
that um, Moses and Samuel were. But you know what you also see in Jeremiah 15, 1? Some people go so far astray, so down the way of evil. God says, even the intercession of Moses and Samuel couldn't turn me to this people. But Moses did intercede. Don't ever underestimate the power of intercessory prayer. It is incredibly powerful. And so God is not going to wipe them all out. So now skip down with me to verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh to the camp, that he saw the calf in the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands, and brake them beneath the mount. Verse 20, And he took the calf which they had made, and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. The perfect prophecy, the perfect type, taking you all the way to Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, and the following verses, where those who are deceived by the false Christ are going to drink that cup of wrath. That is not a situation you want to be in. You wait for the true Christ to return. Now we're going to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. Moses was mentioned here, Mount Horeb, for 40 days and 40 nights. Guess who else is mentioned in connection with Mount Horeb, for, which is also Mount Sinai, for 40 days and 40 nights? Elijah. Do you think that's a coincidence? Absolutely not. So we're going to go. And what happened in 1 Kings chapter 18? Elijah went up against about 400 or more Baal prophets. It might have even been even significantly more than that, but it was at least 400 or 450. Went up against these Baal prophets and you see, they couldn't get their God to bring fire down from heaven because their God doesn't exist. There's only one God. But then Elijah even mocked them a little bit. But what ended up happening, Elijah said, All right, take, let's take the altar. Let's just soak it with water to where it would seem like no fire would even have effect. Then Elijah called upon the Lord and God brought fire down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Proven who the true God is. But there's something that you do never want to forget. Revelation chapter 13. You learn that when Satan's here as the false Christ, at that time he will have power to make fire come down from heaven. And as we're going to see even later in this study, Satan knows the scripture. Do not be surprised at all if when he makes fire come down from heaven... If he says, hey, you remember 1 Kings chapter 18, right? Only the true God can make fire come down from heaven. And he's going to say he is the true God. Do not be deceived. So then now let's go uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And it reads, And Ahab is the king of Israel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Yeah, I didn't even mention that. Elijah slew the Baal prophets. Verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Jezebel saying, Let the gods strike me dead if I don't kill Elijah. Verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Verse 4, probably to protect the servant. He didn't want the servant to be in harm's way. Verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, he is doing exactly what we should not do. Yeah, he's going for, through a really hard time, but you don't just say, O Lord, take me now. No, this is a situation where we learn not to do. You keep going, you stay strong, you keep serving God. Verse 5, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Hey, Elijah still got work to do. So remember this also, that even Elijah, this prophet of God, even he had moments where he was just about ready to give up. 
So yeah, I mean, he, he has like passion just like us. But see, you remember that he, even though he was about ready to give up, he didn't. He kept going. And God gave him the strength exactly what he needed when he needed it. And God would do the exact same thing for you. Stay strong. Call out to the, war, to the Lord. He is with you. Verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. I mean, God completely provides. Do you think it's going to be a problem that there's going to time come during the tribulation you can't buy or sell? No, you don't even need to think about worrying about that for even one second. Or else you would be like those who doubted God even after all He did for them. Verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And remember what's the main thing, the bread of life, the living water. Verse 8. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Moses there, same place, 40 days and 40 nights as Elijah. As we said, that is obviously no coincidence. God's Word is perfect. There's so many connections that gives you proof of many different things. And so Elijah was completely hated here. He felt like he was all alone. Well, guess what? During the tribulation, you will be hated by the world. People will think you are so stupid because you refuse to worship who the whole world thinks is God, this one who's bringing riches and peace and prosperity to the world. And they will hate you for it. And there will be times that you might feel alone, but you are never alone. Verse 9, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? See, Elijah, he's almost kind of just doing his own thing. You do not want to be in a situation during the tribulation where the Lord has to say, Hey, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be doing something else. You will have instruction from the two witnesses. You follow God's instructions to the letter every step of the way. Verse 10, And he said, this is what Elijah said, I have been very jealous or zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down the altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it. You see, he felt like he was the only one. But he wasn't. There were others. And don't ever forget that when you share the truth with others, when you plant seeds, many times you might not even see the fruit of it. You may never ever know what truth that led someone to coming to. Don't get discouraged. Keep serving God. This is quoted in Romans chapter 11. You, uh, Romans about chapters 8 through 11. You read a whole lot about God's elect in those chapters. So this is quoting Romans chapter 11 verse 2 and 3. Now skip down with me to another verse that's quoted in Romans 11. Skip down with me to Romans or to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. And it reads, This is what the Lord says. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. All those that did not take the false Christ as their spiritual husband. This is the prophecy of God's elect who will not bow a knee to the false Christ. So yeah, you might feel alone at times, but you're never alone. The elect are out there. And they will stand against the false Messiah. Do not be deceived. Stay strong. God will be with you every step of the way. Now, terminally, let's go to the New Testament, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. You know, God's Word tells us over and over how Satan works his methods of operation, what he wants, how he will deceive people. We'll learn more about it in Matthew chapter 4. This is going to be Satan trying to tempt Jesus Christ. Of course, he's going to fail miserably. But you're going to see they're in the wilderness. 
We've already seen the wilderness mentioned multiple times. That should remind you of Revelation chapter 12 again, where verse 6 and verse 14 mentioned how you'll be in the wilderness. God, God, it doesn't mean that you're literally going to go off in the wilderness. It simply means God's going to protect you and He's going to provide for you just like He protected and provided for Noah in that ark. When that flood of lies comes out of Satan's mouth of Revelation chapter 12, verse 15, you have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to fear whatsoever. And understand, when Satan is here as the false Messiah, the whole entire world is, it's going to be completely different than anything that anyone's ever even thought of. It's not like, oh yeah, things are still going kind of normal. No. He wants to convince the whole world that it's heaven on earth and the true Christ has arrived. So don't ever underestimate how unbelievable it's going to be. So let's go Matthew chapter 4. Pick it up in verse 1. And you might note of uh, Revelation chapter 17 where John was even, uh, God gave John the interpretation in the wilderness there. So Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 and it reads, then was, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Well, why? To teach us. To teach us this prophecy. Verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. So you see, he was so, his flesh body was so hungry. He, he was in a flesh body, but he never sinned. But he did feel things such as hunger. So understand, Satan knew that Christ was super hungry. He knows all of our weaknesses. He will, you, he will exploit it every way that he can. So you better not have some type of vice or something that you're hung up on because Satan will use it every time, especially during the tribulation. You do not want to be hung up on anything. You can't afford to. Verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Hey, if you're really the Son of God, perform a miracle, make you some food so you can eat. Verse 4, But he answered, this is what Jesus Christ said. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, about verse 6 is what this is quoting. Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up unto the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. That word pinnacle, it's basically the, this Greek word is basically the equivalent of the Hebrew word translated as overspreading in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. What a connection. Verse 6, And saith unto him, is what Satan says to Christ, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Hey, just jump off this mountain. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, we mentioned before, Satan knows the Scripture. He's quoting Psalm chapter 91, verse 11. But guess what? He barely changed it just enough to make it completely false. He added that little phrase, at any time. Satan's trying to make it sound like, oh yeah, just go jump off a building and the angels will save you at any time. No, that's not what it means. It's saying in Psalms 91, if you are serving God, then the angels will be there to protect you and to save you. And of course, it's God that does the saving, but He does utilize His servants. But you know, basically right after that in Psalms chapter 91, what it says? It says the head of the dragon is going to be crushed. And Satan's head will be crushed. He will be destroyed. So what do you know? Satan wanted to completely twist that scripture. Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's about Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. Verse 8, Again, the devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. You know what it says in Luke chapter 4? It says that he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in one moment of time. That's a miracle we can't even begin to fathom. 
Never underestimate how unbelievable the deception is going to be. In Mark 13, it says that if the time was not shortened, even the elect would be deceived. And that, you see, Satan knows he's going to easily deceive everybody else. So that's his main focus, trying to deceive the elect. Are you ready for it or not? But we have to keep studying every day. And no one ever better say, oh yeah, I don't need to study anymore. No, then you're going to be deceived for sure. We study every day diligently so we can be ready. If any man thinks he knows a thing, he knows nothing as he ought to know. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. As we continue to study, God continues to reveal more and more truths, more understanding of prophecy. Verse 9. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. That's what Satan wants. He wants to be worshipped. He's not coming as the Antichrist to slaughter billions of people. That's not what it's about. He's coming claiming to be the Messiah, to claim to be. Daniel chapter 8, verse 12. Of course, he's the false Messiah. Jesus Christ is the only Messiah. But like it says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, Satan by peace shall destroy many. He's wanted to be worshipped ever since he originally rebelled in the first earth age. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19. And that's what he's coming to do. And let's make something real clear. The Antichrist, false Christ, it's not some flesh man. It is Satan himself that is absolutely vital to understand. Like you, you see in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, Satan is cast out onto this earth. And what's tragic is there's a lot of people that will try to tell you that, oh, no, that already happened. Well, how can you say that? We already mentioned Job chapter 1 and 2, where you see Satan and angels going before God in heaven. He's in heaven right now. So how are you going to try to say that already happened? It hasn't. But Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, Satan will be cast out. The fallen angels are coming with him. It is not a flesh man. It is Satan. That's why you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light, which means he is disguised. He will claim to be the true light. Verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship, or him only shalt thou serve. Verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Where's Christ at in the wilderness? Remember Revelation chapter 12 with the wilderness. God is going to protect and provide and lead and guide you every step of the way. Now to complete this study, turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. We have here um, uh, the time of after Christ's resurrection. And I believe this is the only place where it tells you uh, how many days he walked with them after the resurrection. Guess what it is? It's 40 days. And you do have a destiny. We've mentioned Mark 13 that your destiny is to stand against the false Christ and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. And what's, what's a great deal of the book of Acts about, especially the first few chapters, about the coming of the Holy Spirit? And you see, it happened on Pentecost Day. But it was even the type of the prophecy to teach you about what would happen when the Holy Spirit speaks through you when you stand against the false Messiah. Now let's go. And multiple times here, it's going to be in the English, the Holy Ghost. But it, that's, the correct translation is the Holy Spirit. You know, God's Spirit isn't scary. It's not a ghost. Which, nothing scares you anyway if you serve Jesus Christ. But the point is it's the Holy Spirit. So that's how I'm going to say it when we read this. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, The former treaties, or the, the former account, it can even mean a written account, and this directly connects you to Luke chapter 1, verse 3. The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Verse 2, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after that incredible suffering of the crucifixion. By many infallible proofs, it's undeniable, being seen of them forty days, 
and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. And this will take you back to Luke chapter 24, verse 49, where he said, Don't leave Jerusalem until that Holy Spirit comes. And this is what it says even in John chapter 15, verse 26 and 27. It says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And the elect have been. They stood against Satan in the first earth age, and they were chosen before the foundation of this world. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Verse 5. For John, that means John the Baptist, truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. You don't know the set exact time, but you know what we do know? The order of events. And over and over and over, including 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which makes it so clear, no one could ever doubt it, that before we're gathered together to Jesus Christ is the deception of Satan as the false Christ. That falling away, that apostasy, where he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, and he will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He wants you to worship him. Don't ever, ever do it. Verse 8, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. And that was even the case even back then when the gospel would be preached all over. But you know it's prophecy that when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, it is understood in every language of the world all at one time. And the word of God will be prophesied to the world when you make that stand. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. This is when Christ returned to the Father. Verse 10, And they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Verse 11, to complete this study, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, not the false one, but this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. As you would see in the next verse, they were on the Mount of Olives. So guess what? Jesus Christ is returning here to set up his kingdom. And there is so much in this that what's Pentecost is what you would read in Acts chapter 2. That's when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And Pentecost, that's 50 days after the Passover. Now, first of all, you see, I already mentioned it, I think, how when the Holy Spirit, that cloven tongue like as a fire is spoken, it's understood in every language of the world all at one time. And that's why you see in Luke chapter 21, when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, even your enemies can't gainsay nor resist it. But that will happen. Everyone that hears the Holy Spirit speak through you, if there could be a person that speaks Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, German, guess what? They all hear it in their very own language. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what will happen when you are delivered up. The thing about this also you got that 50 days, right? Over and over in this study, we've had that testing time, 40 days and 40 nights. And Christ walked with them for 40 days after his resurrection. But then you still got that 10 days to, to lead up to the Pentecost. Well, what's that take to you in prophecy? Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. The 10 days that you are delivered into prison when you are delivered up. 
when it's time for the Holy Spirit to speak through you. God's Word is perfect. It proves itself over and over. And like it says in Luke chapter 21, verse 18, when that time comes, not one hair on your head will perish. God is with you. Remember Noah and his family in that ark. They were sealed up, protected. And you are as well if you have that seal of God in your forehead. If you study to show yourself approved. That ultimate test is coming. The greatest deception, the greatest affliction of all time of the false Messiah. Are you ready for it or not? Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word in this place you've given us. We can teach your word. We thank you for just showing us the different connections in the scripture and preparing us for that time that's coming. We just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. This was recorded in the year 2024 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.